lot of my dear friends and welcome. Really lovely to see you again. So I would like to introduce in this episode um, a Māori leader who I really deeply admire, respect and um, really cherish his teachings. Um, and I've mentioned it before, so uh, he is Sir Mason Dury, of course, and I'd like to introduce him formally because I have here some of his achievements and I think um, he's one of those amazing figures that really warrants uh, a formal introduction, I think. So let me read for you. For over 40 years, he has been at the forefront of a transformational approach to Māori health and has played major roles in building the Māori health workforce. His efforts have been recognised by the Royal Australian and New Zealand College of Psychiatrists, the Public Health Association and New Zealand, the Māori Medical Practitioners Association and so on. I mean, he's really an exceptional figure. So he is, he trained as a psychiatrist, um, but really that title doesn't really do him justice. I think, I think um, having met him, having had the great privilege of actually meeting him, having a, a, a corridor with him and, um, you know, actually asking lots of questions and being that annoying person at the conference. <laughs> yeah I don't really care you know I wasn't gonna waste that opportunity I feel like that title doesn't really do him justice he's just really a, I would say a wise medicine man almost and much more I can't even find the words really I attended his event which was in tandem with his um the release of his book which is here as you can see I've got it all bookmarked it's, it's one of my favorite books particularly on uh, Māori health and helping me understand you know how to make links between um uh, the Māori approach to things, so tikanga, and also, um, you know, my practice as a psychotherapist. And really that's where I had a lot to converse with him about. And I'll, I'll get to that in a He's minute. He's one of those people that I feel as though, um, whether, I'm sorry, you might not like this, but I will come back to him time and again, because I just learn, every time I read a bit more, I understand a bit more, I learn a bit more. You know, he's one of those people that fascinates me and his teachings are so rich and, um, you know, go across many, many decades really. So I feel as though I will come back to him. But today I wanted just to share um, three things that I learned from that first initial encounter with him. That might be quite challenging actually to keep it down to three, but I'll do my best, okay? I think the first thing that was really powerful for me, um, that I don't know if I learned for the first time, but certainly he framed something for me in a new way, which was powerful, was just the idea of, of different bodies of knowledge. And in his career, how he encountered, um, you know, some challenges sometimes with the Western medical perspective and the Māori way of doing things in terms of healthcare. Uh, so for example, he shared so many stories that were really beautiful. One of them that I remember was of a, a young woman who was unwell and, you know, mentally unwell, and I believe probably sectioned from his description. Um, and what was interesting was that the doctors had their idea about, you know, what needed to be in her space, in her room, in her ward. Um, and her family had another idea. They really wanted to bring in elements from nature, for example, for example, a, a living plant and something that was, um, you know, linked to her, her fucker papa and to, to bring in certain elements that would definitely improve her, her well-being, you know, her, the energy in the space. And, you know, there was a lot of a conversation, I think, between the doctors and I and perhaps there was some sensitivity about bringing in um, some of these elements that, that was questionable. So there they might have been some genuine grounds, but it was just really interesting because what I feel Sir Mason Duru was speaking to and what he kind of shared with us was just how, um, and again, I, I feel like I talk about this a lot, but really how it was so, it's all too easy for Western medicine, which has its own way of thinking um, and compared to indigenous ways of, of doing things and the Maori way of doing things, um, to be kind of dismissive or disparaging about bringing in, you know, for example, a certain plant or whatever. In the end, the family's wishes won, won out. And this woman, of course, began to improve. And I think the other thing that was linked to that was just the importance of working with the whanau. Like it was this young woman who happened to be ill, but the whole family needed to be involved in getting her well. And this is a story, I, I there's no way I can do it justice because it, it's, it was really in depth and beautifully shared um, by Samay Sanduri. But I just felt 
my takeaway from that was just a reminder that just because somebody doesn't understand your cultural, uh, the cultural underpinnings of your um, your heritage, it doesn't mean that they're wrong, right? And um, I find that fascinating because, you know, as I maybe have said elsewhere, I, you know, my culture is a real blend, you know, I am British, but I have a Chinese mum, you know, so I, for many years, and in case you don't know this backstory, I've, again, I feel like I've shared this many times elsewhere, perhaps, but, you know, for example, in regards to my Chinese mum, this is a woman who was originally my, my doctor and um, actually became more like almost a spiritual teacher. Um, so not only did she heal me, but she taught me a great deal. She taught me so much for over the course of about six years that we worked together. Um, about traditional Chinese medicine and traditional Chinese wisdom and how to heal the body um, with herbs and medicine and acupuncture. Although I never formally became a student of hers and certainly there was no kind of formal arrangement like that. But just through that oral tradition, which is so rich in many cultures, including, to my understanding, Maori culture, I learned like it was like a schooling I had effectively and it was something I can only kind of reflect on now when you can look back and think wow I actually know a ton <laughs> you know and I learned you know without even realizing that I was learning so you know for me I know that there is a lot of discussion sometimes around oh acupuncture does it work does it not work Chinese medicine what is it it's all just woo-woo and they kill animals as well well no actually not every Chinese medical doctor uses animal parts in their practice it's not necessary my Chinese mum never used any of that stuff on me because I'm vegetarian so that was never gonna never gonna fly nonetheless and, and there's a, there's so much um misunderstanding misconception and this is what I feel Sir Mason Jury really underpinned for me and helped me really um affirm in my own heart that you know people will not always understand your cultural heritage it doesn't mean it's wrong it doesn't mean it's um it doesn't have value it does have value but you need to actually understand it and many people will never understand so you know i think that was a powerful it was just the way he said it different bodies of knowledge that's the thing that was like light bulbs going off for me Another point of learning in my development that, that Sir Mason Dury crystallised was around um, the importance of understanding how our children, our, our tamariki, um, flourish and the fact that they spend a lot of time, obviously, online and to understand their online worlds as worlds rather than thinking of it as, you know, oh, just something that they do as a, as a bit of fun. Consider that it's another environment. That for me was like, you know, mind blowing. And it's, it's really changed my practice as a clinician and influences everything, influence everything from that moment on and to this day and will do forever. Because I think it's so powerful and wise and intelligent if we think of it that way. And one of the things that Sir Mason Dury um, taught us was that we need to appreciate that, you know, our, the online worlds that our children spend a lot of time in, and I say our children in terms of the collective, by the way, it doesn't matter whether you have children or not, all the children are our children. We are responsible for sa the safeguarding of all children, in my view, okay? So uh, being an advocate for children, obviously that's the position I hold. You might not want to share that, but you know, when I say tamariki, I mean all tamariki, all children, we need to be mindful of the environments that they spend their time in. And think that actually those environments are not always very clean you know if they went to school and you knew that the, in their classroom there was a a, a a page three you know girl with her legs wide open and she, it's a five-year-old child you would think about that but actually that's what children are actually finding online and that's their environment so we need to be really mindful of that and this is something that I'm super passionate about so to have him explain it in that way was really um, profound for me and revelatory and really helped my thinking about how to um, better serve my patients, the people I look after as a psychotherapist. Another really powerful um, lesson I learned from Sir Mason Dury from that conference and uh, from his writing and particularly in this book, which I highly recommend. I mean, it is it is quite academic in many respects, but at the same time, I think it's pretty readable as well. And the name is Mauriora. 
and it's, the subtitle is the, the Dynamics of Maori Health and I highly recommend it by Mason Dury. Okay, It was really interesting. So around the time of um, the conference, I actually had read a headline. I think my husband had shared an article with me or something and it was from the UK. So it was from our homeland um, and it was all about um, an uproar. It was from somebody who believes himself to be, now let me get this right, a uh, transracial person who uh, was born and uh, identified as a white person at birth, but came later to believe and to, to consider themselves a black person. So this is a transracial identity. That would be the correct way, to, the correct and polite, be polite <laughs> way of considering this, um, this identity, okay? So trans identities are always controversial anyway, but I was really fascinated to learn from Sir Mason Dury how this might be understood in terms of um, the Māori perspective. And his response was really interesting. And he basically said that this would be not possible really in, in the in Māori um, culture. There's no way you can, you know, I couldn't say I'm trans Māori or something. I don't actually know what I would call myself, but do you, do you get my point, right? He basically said it's just not possible because the only way you can obviously be Māori is if you have fucker papa. So, you know, that was really interesting for me because I was interested on not just the, the answer that he gave, but the way he gave it as well, if that makes sense. And the fact that it was very simple, very clear cut. Um, and, you know, this is, as I say, I know these, these sorts of themes are very controversial and I'm not saying I, I, I'm believing in one way or another or I go, agree with one thing or another. One of the wonderful things about being a psychotherapist, which people often miss and don't appreciate and understand, is that it's not my job to be a judge. I'm not a judge. I'm a psychotherapist. My job is to try and understand. It's a much more enlightened position, in my view, obviously, because you know, you're not actually sitting in judgment of another person. It's actually trying to understand their thinking and their process. It's not about me imposing, well, I think that's terrible. People come out with their stupid comments in the comment sections. They're only showing their own idi idiocy and um, poor, you know, <laughs> lack of education, you know? So, you know, that's not my, that's not my role. Everyone is entitled to their own opinion, but it's, that's less important to me. So just in case you're wondering, what is crucial is in this instance, I was very interested to hear what Sir Mason Dury would say about how that might, and obviously may not, is the answer, uh, fit into the Māori perspective. So um, yeah, I found that really fascinating, particularly because in the case that I re I'm re referencing in the UK, and I, I can't remember the, the details except just some basics, the, the person in question was um, arguing that they um they wanted some funding it was to do with arts funding so i believe it was some kind of um uh, arts um production or or a theater um production of some kind and this person was saying that you know i'm eligible for um black and ethnic minority that umbrella of funds because i'm transracial i'm tra i'm i'm black yeah? i i consider myself black so this was a huge ferrari in the, the uk obviously um and um yeah i mean with good reason i think it's righteous that it's contested because uh and contested and you know whatever conclusion is reached is whatever conclusion it reaches that's how the law works isn't it you have these test cases that blow everything up and then sometimes the law is changed forevermore as a result of um the outcome and i think that's right i think everyone should have their chance to argue their their case and 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 see what comes out of that but yes so it is very interesting that um you you know, that really couldn't happen in terms of um, Māori culture, according to Sir Mason Dury. There's so much more I want to share about what I've learned from this incredible figure. And I will do my best to add a photo, add the photo of our meeting, uh, me like with starry eyes kind of thing. Uh, from the day if I can find it and if I can use it as my thumbnail, I will do that so you can have a look. And by the way, just to kind of show you that this is for real, for real. That's his signature right there. So can you see that? Yeah, so I really did meet him and it really was amazing, amazing guy. You know, I think sometimes I, um, you know, the people who I admire the most are often psychiatrists actually. In the UK, I remember the very first time that I met um, 
Jeremy Holmes. So Jeremy Holmes is also a psychiatrist in the UK, maybe retired now. Um, and I was in awe of him when I met him because I'd already read his books and come across his work and just how incredibly he had kind of blended psychoanalytic perspectives and way of working, ways of working with attachment theory. So that will mean nothing to many of you. I appreciate that. <laughs> but for me, uh, it was, it was really like, it was like coming home to like this is how I want to practice my my clinical work you know so it was a huge honor to actually learn from him in the end at the University of Exeter and I was really lucky because we were just the final cohort I think where he was still teaching more actively I think now he just gives conferences and stuff and doesn't teach so much but if he's still teaching at all or giving conferences because you know he was at that stage where I know he was it's kind of winding down but amazing guy so yeah for me rock stars are often these incredible psychiatrists who've contributed so much to the field and so mason dury is absolutely one of those figures um and no doubt much more much more than i could ever know at this point because i'm still learning that's what this series is all about so my friends thank you so much for joining me once again i hope you've enjoyed this one don't forget give it a thumbs up subscribe to my youtube channel and leave a nice comment below or drop me just a heart if you haven't got much time and i look forward to seeing you in the next episode kia ora